Good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome. Uh, I'll just get the practicalities done there now. Um, could I start by asking people, interesting that we're talking about data protection, to turn off their phones, please, <laughs> uh, or certainly turn them to silent. Um, we're very glad to have you all here today and have such an expert on a, sub a subject that I was saying to some people downstairs, you know, about seven or eight years ago, if you mentioned data protection, um, eyes glazed over and people said, oh, thanks be to God, I don't really need to know too much about that and, you know, get on with the real hard criminal stuff or something more interesting. Um, but it's now very much part of our day to day lives. And so today, that's why the Institute is very, very pleased indeed to have the Director General Tina Astola here, because Tina is really our big expert, you see there now. Uh, she is the, um, her title is Director General, and she's in, in the General, uh, Director General for Justice and Consumers at the European Commission. And um, we were talking to her downstairs, and it's a sort of area that, in a way, covers every single facet of our lives. Now, we have a mixed audience here, but everybody in this room in some way is here because they're interested in what they should be doing, whether they're running a company, whether they're running an institution, whether they're an individual barrister or a court officer. They are trying to find out what it is they need to know. And so um, Director General Estola is going to... She's going to shed lights on the, on the links between protection and security. Um, we all want the baddies' information to be exchanged with as many people as possible so they can be caught. But we never consider ourselves the baddies, so we don't want our information to be shared with anybody. Our sons and daughters, our nieces, our nephews, our uncles, our aunts. We get upset if we think somebody has stolen their identity or information. But the truth of it is that the data protection and security are, are tied in very tightly together. And... Um, Tina is going to tell us about the, um, the possibilities of ensuring that both security and privacy are protected. And uh, you many, many of you will know that the, the new regulation is due in in May 2018 and will require a lot of changes to legislation. And that work is already ongoing in, in our government here and hopefully in every other EU country. Um, so I'm going to ask um, Director General Astola to talk to us and then there will be time. Now her, her statement is on the record. Um, I don't know whether you mind if the questions and answers are on or off the record. I forgot it's to as ask you. Wish. Uh, as, as we wish. Well, that's fine. Because there may be some members yeah. of the, of the um, jur journalist profession here. So we we'll listen to what you have to say. I should say that uh, Mrs. Astola was a permanent secretary of the Finnish Ministry of Justice and um, she had responsibility for international and domestic law matters, courts, prisons, and before that she headed up units for civil law and European law at the Department of Legislation. So there really is no area that you're not an expert on, so we're really looking forward <laughs> to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much indeed. And then no expert on anything. I think it's more like that. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. I've been in the country a couple of times. I've admired the nature, and people have been extremely friendly always to me. And of course, then you have fine songs and magnificent literature. So I'm sorry that I can only be here for the day. Uh, today, really, I'm looking at a bit about the security and fundamental rights. Uh, data protection, maybe what I'm saying is kind of a basis for the discussion. I'm not going to go to the nitty-gritties of the paragraphs. <clears throat> so uh, to be being, begin with, um, it was really in the Lisbon Treaty that uh, EU firmly set out a vision for a true European uh, area of justice, which ensures the rights for citizens across the Union. And justice became part of the normal EU policies, so the same decision-making as in other areas. And since that, justice area has grown. So we have worked hard to achieve a set of rules 
which strengthen our common values of um, democracy, respect of freedom and rule of law, and which this also respect the different uh, legal systems and traditions of all EU countries. So these are the values which underpin a goal of building an area of justice, fundamental rights and security based on mutual trust. But in these challenging times with rise of populism, terrorism, cybercrime, hate crime, and threats to our dignity and rights, people really question whether things will improve. They question whether the institutions do really provide them uh, security and protect them from challenges. Um, I see that we really have to convince the Europeans not to forget and to embrace really the values, and we must show that we respect and are able to protect their rights. So human rights protection and measures to ensure stronger security go hand in hand, and a safe Europe is essential for the protection of fundamental rights. For me, it's really a combination. Without the respect for fundamental rights, there is no security for, for citizens. The European Union has a legal framework which allows us to respond to threats or to our security, but it requires, at the same time, respect of, for the principles of legality, necessity, proportionality, and non-discrimination. I think this line is what you always hear when you talk about data protection, for instance. The European Union has also a sound body of EU laws that are not only fundamental rights compliant, but also fundamental rights proactive. And a stable and strong legal framework is essential in the democratic regime, where political situations can really change swiftly. We have been seeing these changes lately. They are major, and we have to be aware of them. A few words about justice and security. For me, there is an inherent um, tension between justice and security policies. Um, and this can be seen in the development of the areas in the EU. Uh, after the Amsterdam T Treaty in 1999, there was the so-called Tampere program, which brought a lot of justice initiatives in EU policies. But after that, there was the 2001 Twin Towers, 9-11, and one could really see a shift towards security issues. And uh, it was the Hague program. And then the pendulum went again to different direction. It was um, a Stockholm paper where you could again see rights of the accused uh, and rights in, in other uh, senses to um, uh, being promoted. Now we have had Paris and Brussels. And again, we see that there is a movement towards security. The idea is that with the new EU data protection rules, so the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, EU is full of these abbreviations, and it takes a little bit of time of knowing them, or half of them. And then the Police Directive, uh, these new, both in their EU dimension as well as the approach to our third countries, they really ensure that the privacy of individuals in this, I would say, still relatively new digital world uh, is ensured and at the same time the necessary security measures are effective, targeted and appropriate. So general security considerations and GDPR. We face many challenges to our security. We are sharing more and more of our personal data. Names, addresses, photos, social media posts, our preferences, and even bank deta details. And they say that this data, data sphere will be 10 times bigger already in 2025. So we need a strong protection for consumer trust in order to to also have growth in the e-commerce area. A feeling of security in digital services and in personal data pro processing will give the consumers the confidence that they can take the advantages that the 
digital world offers them. Cyber space poses new risks and threats, and we have to take them seriously. The revelation that computer central processing units, the so-called CPUs, are prone to security flaws, including access to stored private, um, private data, reminds us of that. So the baddies, the unscrupulous people, may use such vulnerabilities to steal sensitive information, including passwords, medical records, and of course, banking information. We know from these massive data breaches, such as those which were caused by WannaCry, Meltdown, and Spectre attacks, that the threat is real and is not just in, in something imagined in Hollywood. And this is crucial. We should not forget also that Uber, um, there was this massive data breach with Uber, which resulted in the theft of information about 60 million users and drivers. And Uber failed to inform about this for a year. So the GDPR will allow us to respond adequately to such irresponsible behavior. And there will be a high level of protection for the citizens. And, and there are clear rights. I'm not going to through all of them. I'm just mentioning some. So one is to have the right to ask your personal data from somebody who has it, from the organization. The right to ask to transmit your data to a different service provider where feasible, so this right to portability. And the right to clear and understandable information when you are asked to give your consent. We all know these questions and we all click because we don't even understand what we are asked about. Or the right to be forgotten, a big right. At the same time, the GDPR imposes clear obligations on the entities processing personal data, <laughs> security requirements, purpose limitation, notification of data breaches, etc. But the GDPR uh, allows for operators to process data for fraud prevention or for other law enforcement purposes, but this must be done in compliance with the regulation. Correspondingly, National enforcers, the data protection authorities, will have uniform powers everywhere in EU, including the power to fine up to 4% of the global turnover, annual global turnover. Then the relationship between enforcement and data protection. Security is a multifaceted concept which speaks both to public bodies as well as to private sector. But any action in the name of security cannot be justified just because data are available, technically easy to get or useful, rather than necessary. The Court of Justice of the European Union has delivered many judgments and opinions on this point and stressed the need to properly consider the necessity, proportionality and, and data uh, protection safeguards. And this is, of course, particularly important when large amounts of personal data are kept for enforcement, law enforcement purposes, for example, telecommunications data held by service providers or used in the context of passenger name record data. So the court has set criteria, for instance, it should be targeted, there should be a, a suspicion of serious crime, there should be court, author, court authorization. So the data protection reform provides a legal solution for data protection safeguards, which strengthen both security and privacy, but it also allows free flow of data in, within the union. For law enforcement, the answer, the tool, is in the police directive. This directive enhances cooperation between law enforcement authorities to fight crime notably money laundering, terrorism, organized crime and cybercrime, and at the same time ensuring the respect for fundamental rights uh, to protection of personal data. So we want to make sure that the law enforcement authorities help to protect peaceful societies and ensure that law um, and justice, uh, rule of law, uh, ensure the rule of law and justice online. My commission always says that there has to be the same rule of law in online as it is in the real life. 
They must treat personal data, including that of victims and witnesses of crime, in a current and lawful way. So some words which describe this in the directive are you ha it, the data has to be adequate, rele relevant, not excessive, accurate, up-to-date, and there sh it should be not be kept no longer than needed. Then moving to the international air arena. The EU approach of data protection is that the protection travels with the data. So the Commission understands very well the economic and security importance of international data flows and firmly believes that ensuring a data level, high level of um, data protection can go in hand in hand with policy of facilitating such data flows. There was a communication a year ago in January in exchanging and protecting personal data in a globalized world. And that describes the vision and strategy to promote kind of upward convergence of data protection standards around the world. So this strategy builds on the GDPR toolbox for international transfers. An adequacy decision stands for the most privileged relationship the EU can have with another country in the field of data protection and data flows. Adequacy findings are one, although not only one, of the key elements of this strategy. And in these um, uh, decisions, the Commission assesses the level of the data protection of a third country. It should be, as the court has said, essentially equivalent. If this is assessed, then the Commission can take the so-called adequacy decision on the basis of which then the data can flow. Um, but there are other uh, possibilities also if the country's uh, the level of uh, data protection is not enough. Uh, there can be the standard clauses uh, which can be used. And also if there's a company uh, which, has, uh, which works in, in many countries, it can have internal rules uh, which uh, take care of the data protection. In the Scherms ruling, which was about the safe harbor arrangement with the, EU's, with the US, um, the court confirmed that any third country access to personal data for law enforcement or national security purposes has to be limited what is necessary and proportionate. Again, the same words. Proportionality comes up every time. So, it's not only about the question that the companies in these third countries take care of the data protection. It's also about the question how public authorities have access to um, EU citizens, not only EU citizens, people uh, residing in EU, their data in, in the third countries. So <clears throat> we are looking at this government access um, uh, possibilities in other countries and we have to determine that when uh, we are working with the adequacy decisions and uh, this has been they have to apply by the they have to be equ essentially equivalent to the GDPR and also to the police directive so Commission has learned from the Shermsk case uh, and we are taking this issue to government uh, of government access very seriously. And it is a standard routine element in our adequacy assessment. And we have now carried out such an assessment, of course, in, it's an in-depth, it was really the thorough work with the US in the privacy shield, which we probably know about. And now we are discussing both with Japan and South Korea, and I think the following countries will probably be India and Brazil. So, and we are also um, monitoring the functioning of existing adequacy decisions, and we have then an intensive dialogue with these third countries with, um, whose adequacy we have assessed. And as far as the transfers of personal data across the Atlantic are concerned, we have obtained with the Privacy Shield commitments from the EU or US government. These commitments, together with the applicable law in US, ensure that any access 
to personal data uh, for law enforcement or national security purposes is limited to what is necessary and proportionate. There was the first review of Privacy Shield um, last September in Washington, and we could see that the um, Americans had really put in place structures uh, with which to work in this field, and we also um, were informed how they work in the public um, uh, or the public authority access. It's clear that no state tells exactly, we wouldn't tell exactly how we are doing things. But we were given assurances, we were given examples, and also about the remedies of the people, how to, to access courts should they think that their privacy has been um, intruded. So um, there's a commission, um, I don't think it's a communication uh, on this um, review, which tells um, our view on that. We still thought that they could be more proactive in some ways, but we saw that the, the kind of a machinery was in place. Uh, in parallel, uh, we have also negotiated, um, or earlier already, the so-called umbrella agreement with US. And this puts in place a comprehensive uh, high-level data protection framework for EU-US law enforcement cooperation. So the agreement covers all personal data, names, addresses, criminal records, etc., exchanged between EU and US authorities, competent for the prevention, detection, investigation, and prosecution of criminal offenses, including terrorism. So that umbrella is not the legal basis for transferring the data. Uh, there have to be exist other rules for that bilateral agreements or such, but this agreement puts on top of that the requirements that have to be fulfilled in data protection. The way forward. Um, it was mentioned already, May 25, the new rules of GDPR and police directive come in force, and all the member states um, should have implemented the directive and made the changes necessary in order to, for the regulation to, to work well. But the clock is really ticking. And it's not a trivial matter to, 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 to protect this data. And we need to make sure that member states, the data protection supervisory authorities, civil society and business, apply the rules correctly and in a coherent way. So last week, we published a communication outlining the steps that the Commission has undertaken in this area and also what needs to be done. We also issued a guidance to help prepare citizens, businesses, and other organizations for these rules. And we launched a practical tool, a website in all EU languages. The language of the GDPR is not easy. So it is important that it's also written in a, a understandable way for people. And of course, I know there is a lot of activity going in this area, but we have also financed um, or giving um, uh, grants to, to member state organizations so that they could do the work, because really the work has to be done in the member states. So for me, data protection is one example where really at EU level we can have an impact on people's lives in member states. As the, the data travels so fast from uh, country to country, uh, we have to have common rules. And data protection speaks about self-determination, empowerment and construction of the self. So I don't repeat anymore my basic line, which is which I repeat now, security and data protection go hand in hand. They are not opposite to each other. Thank you. Thank you